The fifth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, one of the most exalted books in the portion of the Vedas that deal with spiritual knowledge, offers a bewildering explanation about the structure of the universe. According to this explanation, the art is part of Jambudvipa, a gigantic flat structure that divides the universe in half. In the lower part, there are subterranean worlds, inhabited by the Ashuras, demoniac beings, while the upper part is filled by numerous stars and planets organized in disks. Not only that, but our South Ocean is just the first one in a series of concentric oceans intercalated with concentric islands. For one with a little bit of scientific background, this explanation can appear purely imaginative, but if we go beyond the surface, it's actually very complex, deep and intriguing. First of all, the Vedas also give a view of the universe that is very similar to modern science. In the Surya Siddhanta, the structure of the solar system is described with remarkable similarity to the modern astronomy, with the size, orbits, and distance to the planets being described with pinpoint accuracy. According to the Surya Siddhanta, the diameter of the Earth is 8,000 miles, while modern estimate is 7,928 miles. The distance to Mars is 1.54 AU, astronomical units, while the modern estimative is 1.52 AU, and so on. The Surya Siddhanta even hints on the orbit of Uranus, which was discovered only in 1781. It happens that the Surya Siddhanta explains the universe according to our human sense perception. Since science is also based in sense perception, it's no wonder that the numbers are very similar. However, the portions of the Vedas that deal with spiritual subjects, like the Srimad Bhagavatam and other Puranas, explain the universe according to the sense perception of the Devas, more evolved beings that live in the upper planetary systems. In other words, it doesn't describe the universe we experience with our senses, but the way they experience the universe. It may sound strange that different beings could have such different conceptions of reality, but this is actually something that we can observe even in our own planet. Carnivorous animals, like tigers, see in black and white, while we see in colors. Butterflies can see ultraviolet light that is invisible to us, while certain animals can't see at all, being guided only by smell. Our concept of reality is based on electrical signals our brain receives from their eyes, nose, ears, etc. If one would receive a different set of senses, he would perceive reality in a different way. In other words, we can only understand the world to the extent our senses allow it. The same way a person that is completely blind will never be able to understand what color is, the limitations of our senses prevent us from seeing and understanding many things that are experienced by higher beings. Apart from physical differences, there is also a difference in consciousness. The concept of reality of an ant is rudimentary if compared to a human being, for example. Similarly, our concept of reality is very limited if compared to the view of more evolved beings. Another way we can understand this is that in the same room we can have different frequencies of radio signals, like AM, FM, TV, 4G, 3G, etc., each one carrying a particular set of information. Although all the signals are simultaneously available, the one you can tune in depends on the device you are using. One that is using an old radio will be able to capture only sound, while others with a television will be able to also see images. One with a phone, on the other hand, will have access to the internet, which includes much more content, including the radio and TV programs. Similarly, our universe is composed of different dimensions and we can synchronize in each one according to the particular set of senses we got, which is in turn determined by our previous consciousness. According to the Vedas, our concept of reality is determined according to our consciousness. Because of our consciousness, we assume a particular type of body in a certain planet and have access to a certain level of reality.
In our case, we live in a gross dimension, where the universe appears cold and almost vacant, with the stars and planets very distant from each other and practically inaccessible for us. We are essentially imprisoned in our little planet by the law of gravity. Even if we send some probes or astronauts at an exorbitant cost to investigate what is beyond, they can't find anything very interesting outside. In our dimension, planets and stars that are part of different planetary systems are distributed in a more or less homogeneous way across the cosmos, but for higher beings, planets of similar level or synchrony are closer to each other, and the inhabitants can go from one to the other through interplanetary pathways. It's described, for example, that certain passages in the Himalayas connect our planet to the celestial planets, but only persons with a certain level of consciousness can access such passages. In the Mahabharata is described how Pandavas ascended to the place of Kuvera, the king of the Yakshas, through one of these pathways. For one that is able to cross these pathways, the other parts of Jambudweep are just a walk away. And therefore the Srimad Bhagavatam describes these different interconnected fragments as a continuous area, which is exactly the perception of one that is traveling through them. Although, in your sense perception, these different parts of the structure are spread through different planets. For one that doesn't have the proper qualification, however, the pathways are invisible and he will be stuck on this planet. As a result, when he crosses the Himalayas, he goes to China instead of the celestial planets. The existence of connected objects that are far apart, as well as shortcuts that allow one to access places that are far away, may seem fantasious. But these ideas are also discussed in modern physics, with the phenomenon of quantum entanglement and the theory of the wormholes, for example. Similarly, the moon is described in the Vedas as a celestial planet where pious souls can live in great delight for 10,000 years. In our gross dimension, however, the moon appears as just a lifeless piece of rock. This leads us to the concept of vertical dimension explained in the Vedas. Suppose you want to visit an office in the 98th floor of a prestigious building in Manhattan. You take a taxi and you go to the ground floor of the building. You went to the right place on the horizontal dimension. But to reach the office, you need to also travel in the vertical dimension, taking a lift or the stairs, going up until you reach the 98th floor. If somehow your credentials don't allow you to go up, then you will be stuck in the lobby. Similarly, even if one is able to go to the moon, without the proper consciousness he will not be able to travel in the vertical dimension, and will therefore be stuck in the representation of the moon in our gross dimension, which is not so interesting. If one wants to access the celestial moon, he will need to travel by elevating his consciousness and transferring oneself there at the time of death. In this way, he will be able to accept a celestial body with a proper set of senses to interact with the inhabitants there. The great contribution of the view of the universe given in the Puranas is that it gives a mystical and theistic view of the universe, a universe that is teeming with life. By meditating in these descriptions, one can gradually elevate his consciousness and attain the same level of awareness as higher beings. This is the view of the universe that is going to be presented in the Temple of Vedic Planetarium, the TOVP, when it's inaugurated in 2022. Conversely, the materialistic view of the universe offered by modern science, based solely on the observation using our gross senses, offers one a dead universe that leads only to the stagnation of one's consciousness. The great challenge when we study the model of the universe given the Srimad Bhagavatam is to reconcile what we can observe with our gross sense perception and the ideas of multi-dimensions, different sets of senses and degrees of consciousness and the idea of a vertical dimension. Without understanding this concept, one may end up with some simplistic or limited understanding. As explained in a previous video, 
The model of the universe described in the Puranas, the parts of the Vedic literature that deal with spiritual knowledge, doesn't describe the universe we experience with our sense perception, but rather the way the universe is experienced by higher beings. The model of the universe described in the Puranas is focused in describing the different planetary systems, giving us a map of the different realms of the cosmos and the standard of consciousness one has to develop to access each of them. Although described as disks, these different planetary systems are more like different levels of consciousness that one has access to according to his purity and advancement in spiritual knowledge. In other words, the Vedas give us a map that helps to understand where we are and what is the path to reach the desired destination. The material universe is incredibly big and complex, and a soul can follow innumerable different paths, transmigrating from one body to the next in the wheel of samsara. By understanding this process, we can chalk a brighter path for ourselves and help others. The secret to understand this explanation is to not try to match these different locations with different stars and galaxies, but to try to understand the different levels of consciousness of the inhabitants there. In a previous video, we explored the conception of reincarnation explained in the Bhagavad Gita. We are not the body, nor the mind, but a spiritual particle of pure consciousness, who is independent of the body. Just as one may change his clothes, abandoning the previous ones that are old or damaged, a soul changes to another body when it becomes too old or damaged. When a soul abandons one particular body, we call it death, and when he accepts a new body, we call it birth. This is a cycle that is going on for a very long time. The Vedas explain that there are 8,400,000 forms of life in this universe, amongst which there are 400,000 species of intelligent life, spread through the different planets. Different from the modern scientific definition that classifies species according to their capacity of generating viable offsprings, the species described in the Vedas describe different levels of consciousness. A dog living on a different planet may have a different type of body and does not be able to mate with a she-dog from Earth, but still they are considered one species, according to the Vedas, since they have the same level of consciousness. The souls transmigrate through these different species of life according to their consciousness, action and desires in the cycle of samsara. But when this started, when it's going to end, how the spiritual soul enters into this material universe and how he can live. It's explained that every soul has an eternal relationship with Krishna, a spiritual identity that is eternal and unbreakable. This identity is the true ego or the real identity of the soul. How the soul can go from this position of eternal bliss to the perpetual struggle in the material world is a mystery. However, when this happens, the journey of the soul inside the material realm starts in the Karona Ocean, on the border between the spiritual plane and the material energy. Just like to enter a country one has to pass through its border, similarly the Karona Ocean is a border between the two worlds, a borderline position between the spiritual and the material. The Karana Ocean contains the sum of the material energy, but in an unmanifested state. One way to see it is as an ocean, like is described in poetic language. Another is as a cloud, an unmanifested mass that covers part of the spiritual sky. In order to create the material universes, Krishna takes the form of Mahavishnu, who lays down in the Karana Ocean, creating the material universes and impregnating the material energy with the innumerable souls which desire to take part in the material creation. In the Karana Ocean, the soul is still in an almost pure state and enjoys a degree of spiritual bliss. However, desiring variety, the soul assumes the covering of the false ego, which brings him to material designations. False ego means to accept an identity that is not one's original spiritual position. Under the influence of the false ego, the soul accepts the identity of human beings, demigods, animals and other species. The false ego leads to the other coverings of the soul, intelligence and mind that form the subtle body, the senses and finally the gross body. We examined these coverings in a previous video. The Karana Ocean is the ultimate destination for the followers of the Sunyavada doctrine, Buddhists, who call it Nirvana. 
This is a place where one is free from material duality, but doesn't have access to the varieties of the spiritual kingdom. Souls can stay there for a long time, in perfect peace, but the desire for variety makes them eventually fall into the material universes. Descending from an almost pure state, the soul takes his first birth in Satya Loka, or Brahma Loka, the most elevated planet inside this material universe. There he lives a very long life, full of knowledge and free of miseries. In fact, it is described that the only suffering the inhabitants there experience is compassion for the inhabitants of the lower planets that don't enjoy the same standard of living. Due to this, some of these inhabitants take birth in the lower planets as philosophers and spiritual teachers to share their knowledge and thus help others to progress in the spiritual path. The question is that although very long, the life of the inhabitants of Brahma Loka is limited. Time ticks for them the same way it ticks for us. When the time comes, they need to move out. The problem is that being Brahma Loka the most elevated planet in the universe, there are only two possibilities to get out and go back to the spiritual realm, or to go down to some of the lower planets. The souls that become further entangled with matter go down the second path and take birth in one of the upper planetary systems situated directly below Brahmaloka, Tapaloka, Janaloka or Maharloka. These are subtle planetary systems where high pile souls live. The ones that are very pure and attracted to meditation live in the first two while the ones that are attracted to discipline and pious deeds for the benefit of others live in the third. Again, the soul has the choice of going up or down. The ones that are serious about self-realization may attain liberation and go back to the spiritual planets, or even take another birth in Brahma Loka, but others that become yet more entangled with matter go down, taking birth in Swarga Loka, the celestial planet. In these planets, Pio souls live in great delight, having the opportunity of satisfying their sensual desires. The women there are called apsaras and are just like angels with exquisite beauty and irresistible feminine charms, while the men are extremely strong, intelligent and handsome. Being pious, people are good-natured and innocent. There is very little anger or envy there. This planetary system matches very well the descriptions of paradise we have in other scriptures. A common characteristic of all the upper planets, down to Swargaloka, is that the inhabitants there live a completely natural lifestyle in harmony with nature. They have mystic perfections that allows them to manipulate matter at will, and thus they don't have the need for machines. They can even travel through space using their vimanas and construct whole palaces just by their mere desire. Their view of the different machines we use in our modern age is not much more positive than the view we have from antiquated, cumbersome and dirty machines people were using in the 19th century. Each of the celestial planets in Swargaloka is presided by a particular demigod. These are empowered beings that have control over the forces of nature and execute chores related to the maintenance of the universe, as well as maintaining the inhabitants of their own planets. The problem with Swargaloka is that because of the practically unlimited opportunity for sense gratification, most souls use their time there to simply enjoy heavenly delights instead of pursuing the path of self-realization. Therefore, after a long life there, 10,000 celestial years or 3.6 million years of our time, the soul falls again. The ones that have a little bit of pious credit left take a less birth in heavenly conditions in one of the earthly kingdoms of Bumandala or Buloka. There, the inhabitants have gross bodies almost like us, but they still enjoy a comfortable living standard, not as good as the inhabitants of Swargaloka, but still quite comfortable. These celestial locations are just like vacation resorts, where the ones that are falling from higher realms or that performed pious deeds in the past are allowed to stay for some time to satisfy their remaining material desires. Instead of dollars or euros, the stay there is paid by one's good karma. However, just as one has to leave a resort when his money finishes, one has to leave these heavenly locations when his past merits are exhausted. Having exhausted his pious credits completely, the soul takes his next birth in this earthly planet. It's described that the souls fall down to this realm with the rain, they get thus transferred to different plants that grow grains. 
taking shelter in these grains, the soul is transferred to the semen of a man, and finally to a fetus when there is conception. This is the place we are now. In the next video, we will continue our explanation of the Vedic universe, exploring life in the lower planets and how a soul can make his way back, going this time upwards, back to the higher planetary systems, or achieve liberation, going back to the spiritual sphere. Planet Art, or Bharata Varsha, one of the planets in the intermediary system. This is a place where the inhabitants experience a mixture of conditions from higher and lower planets. There is heat, but there is also cold. There is happiness, but there is also suffering. There is goodness, but there is also cruelty. There is love, and there is hate. There is peace, but there is also war. This is a world of extremes, where we have contact with both good and bad a place of duality, this is the place we are now. In the previous video, we explored the descending path a soul may take when he first enters in the material sphere. We can observe that this descending trip is connected with how much one becomes involved with matter, an association that leads to ambitions and desires. The soul is originally pure, but as one goes downwards inside the material universe, he becomes progressively more involved with lower qualities, like lust, anger and greed. This degrades one's consciousness and makes him go progressively deep in the sequence of different planetary systems. This continues to a certain point where he again comes in contact with spiritual knowledge, be it through a book, a friend or a spiritual teacher, and decide to start his way back this time progressing back to higher levels of consciousness. Our planet is described in the Vedas as Karma Kshetra, a place where souls that exhaust their past karma go to execute different activities and thus create a new baggage of karma that is going to determine their next destination. In other words, this planet is a kind of a cosmic crossroads and the decisions we make here are going to have long-lasting implications. Being a place where we have a difficult life, where we need to work very hard for any small amount of material success, this planet is considered an ideal place to cultivate spiritual knowledge and follow the path of self-realization. Different from the heavenly planets, where there is too much distraction, from the earth a soul can go to any other material planet, from the heavenly Swarga Loka all the way to Brahma Loka, the topmost planet of the material universe, or attain liberation going back home and reattaining his original position in the spiritual planets. However, there is also a great danger. The ones that misuse the opportunity become more and more materialistic. This continue their way down, going thus to the lower planets, where people are just after material comforts, and there is little opportunity for self-realization. This part of the universe is described in the Srimad Bhagavatam as a dark hole, because once one enters there, it's difficult to come out. The lower planets are described as being situated lower than Earth in the cosmic structure. All of them are subterraneous realms where the natural light of the sun doesn't enter. The inhabitants live underground in a perpetual night, depending on different arrangements of artificial lights. Materialists that are very pious have the opportunity of taking birth in the Bila Swarga, Heavenly lower planets where the inhabitants live in comfort, surrounded by material facilities, in cities created by the great architect Maya Danava. In terms of standard of living, the inhabitants of these planets don't live much differently from the inhabitants of Swarga Loka. The main difference is that in Swarga Loka the inhabitants are God conscious and thus they have the opportunity of progressing to higher realms, be it directly or after a stop on Earth. The inhabitants of lower heavenly planets, however, are atheists. The law of karma doesn't discriminate between the two classes, and thus they are able to enjoy a similar standard of living, as long as they remain pious. The problem is that without good association, they tend to gradually lose their piety, and thus sink into the lower levels. Materialists that are less pious take birth in the intermediary lower planets. These are technologically advanced realms. However, different from the higher planets, there is a lot of anxiety in these places, with lots of pressure and competition. Not all have the same opportunities, and everyone struggles to be on top of the other. 
It's a standard of life that is similar to the way people live in most big cities nowadays. In these realms, the inhabitants live completely artificial lives, disconnected from nature. On some of these planets, people are very much addicted to sex and the ones that fall there are exploited with this purpose. Not exactly a good place to go, despite the material facilities. The same way there are pathways that connect our planet with the celestial planets, there are also pathways that connect our planet with these lower realms. This allows the inhabitants of these lower spheres to sometimes visit our planet. The interactions of humans with such beings are however not the most positive ones. Infused with pride and superiority concept, these beings just see human beings as guinea pigs, a race to exploit. Fortunately, higher universal forces limit their actions in our level. Materialists that are impious, too much affected by lower qualities, take part in the lowest planets. There's where things start to become quite dark. These planets offer progressively poorer living standards, more anxiety and less peace of mind. The mentality of the inhabitants is progressively lower and more lust, anger and violence are present. The lowest of these planets are dark places where gigantic intelligent snakes live in holes. Envious and violent, they live disturbed lives where the weaker serpents fear the stronger and they all fear other beings that regularly devour them. Sometimes these reptilians manage to visit our planet and the experiences human beings have in their hands are not the most pleasant. Finally, there are the hellish planets, places where people that commit serious crimes go specifically to pay for the violence they committed to other living beings. Souls that arrive there listing why all their wrongdoings are described by Yamaraj and sentenced to different levels of punishment according to the severity of their crimes. It's described that one that lives by killing animals, for example, has his body pierced by the horns and teeth of the same animals he killed, and the ones that live lives centered around promiscuous sexual relationships have to embrace head-hot metal forms of the opposite sex. Persons that imprison and torture animals have to live in caves where they are tortured by hellish beings. It's not a place one would like to go. Hellish planets are at the bottom of the universe. From there, there is no further way down. A soul that reaches this level has, after paying for his crimes, the opportunity to again take birth in this earth or other intermediary planet, usually as a plant or animal, according to his consciousness, and from there he slowly progresses in the karmic evolutive process until he again takes birth as a human being, a position where he again has the choice of going up or going down. To take birth as a human being on art is considered very fortunate, because here one has the chance of meeting one of the spiritual teachers that propagate transcendental knowledge and thus start his way up back to the spiritual realm. It's easier to take the wrong choices and follow the path of materialism and sense indulgence instead of taking the path of self-realization that demands discipline. That's why most souls end up staying in the material sphere for a very long time going up and down in the cycle of samsara. It's like investing money. One that has a certain capital may invest his money and multiply it by making the right choices. This is going to bring him yet more money that will multiply his opportunities for investments up to the point he may become a billionaire. However, one that just spends his money in a decadent life will eventually spend everything. He may then keep his artificial living standard for some more time by making debts, but eventually his credit will dry out and he will have no other alternatives apart from doing hard work to pay for his debts, and from there start again from the bottom. Similarly, in your current life we have the choice of cultivating spiritual knowledge and self-control and thus create a brilliant path for ourselves by following the spiritual path which will allow us to take birth in the higher planets or to attain liberation. Or we may surrender to carnal desires and abuse the opportunity, creating a path that may not be so pleasant. That's the beauty and the danger of human life. In the Bhagavad Gita, it is mentioned that that which in the beginning may be just like poison, but at the end is just like nectar, and which awakens one to self-realization, is said to be happiness in the mode of goodness. The material path involves instant gratification of one's senses, thus it is a path that is pleasurable in the beginning but painful in the long run. 
The path of progress, on the other hand, involves discipline and restraint. One that is studying to pass a test and enter into a good university, for example, has to renounce many things he would otherwise want to do, and instead pass days and nights immersed in his studies. However, this allows him to achieve a much better position in the future. Similarly, the path of self-realization involves working with our bad habits, vices and lower qualities. Therefore, it is a path that may present certain challenges in the beginning, but will bring us the most sublime results in the end. To be notified when the next videos come, subscribe and click on the bell button. If you are appreciating these videos, don't forget to like and share. If you have any question, comment or curiosity, use the comments, I will be answering them for some time. See you in the next video. So at the bottom of the planetary display we have Shesha holding up the earth. This is Shesh, the empowered incarnation. There we have Ananta speaking Bhagavatam to the four Kumaras. And above, the seven subterranean planets. Here we can see Jambudweep, the central island of uh, Bhumandala. And Bharat Varsha is situated on the southern side of that. There's eight other Varshas with Ilavrita Varsha in the center various supporting mountains with uh, large trees upon them, described in Srimad Bhagavatam. In the very center of Alavrata Varsha is Mount Meru, a golden mountain. Atop Mount Meru are the cities of important demigods, Lord Brahma in the center, eight Dikpalas in the cardinal directions and sub-directions. Moving out, we can see the broader Bhumandala, seven concentric islands and oceans surrounding them. The seventh of these islands is Pushkardweep. On that island is Manasotra mountain, and on the mountain there is various cities of demigods such as Indra. Out further is Loka Loka mountain. These large elephants stand atop Loka Loka mountain to balance Bumandala. Outside of Loka Loka mountain is Aloka Varsha, which is dark. The rays of the sun and the other luminaries extend up to Loka Loka mountain. On Manasotra mountain here, on Pushkara Dweep, the sun travels above this mountain at the southernmost point of its annual orbit. Above Bhumandala is Bhuvaraloka, which is the residence of the Charanas, Siddhas, Yakshas, Gandharvas. And above there is Swargaloka, beginning from the sun and extending up to the pole star Dhruvaloka. This is the moving part of the planetary display. Here we can see the sun and the moon moving in their chariots. The chariots are being drawn by horses moving in the anticlockwise direction, but they're traveling with the wheel of time moving in the clockwise direction faster. So it looks as if they're moving backwards. Above them, uh, the zodiac of stars, more planets, and another realm of stars. So here we can see everything moving with the Kala Chakra, circumambulating the axis that connects Mount Meru with Dhruvaloka. Above these planets, we come to the planet of the seven sages, the Saptarshi. You can see them here, they're commonly known as the Big Dipper, and then Dhruvaloka, the pole star. On the ocean of milk situated there, Kshiradakshaya Vishnu, who is the Paramatma within everyone's heart, he resides on Anantashesh. Moving up beyond there, we have Mahaloka, Janaloka, Tapaloka, and Satyaloka. In this video, we haven't included many of the details for there, but on Mahaloka, Janaloka, Tapaloka, we have residences of the Lord, such as Lord Varaha, Lord Vamana, and so on. Here's Brahmaloka, and on Brahmaloka, we also have a form of the Lord Gabadakshay Vishnu as the Sahasra Shirsha Purush. Beyond there is the seven coverings of the universe, earth, water, fire, etc. And outside of the universes is the abode of Lord Shiva, Shiva Loka. There he resides eternally. Beyond Shiva Loka, we come to Maha Vishnu. 
Kara no Dakishaya Vishnu, with innumerable universes that are emanating from the pores of his transcendental body. Here you can see him being served by Rama Devi. Then we come to the Brahma Jyoti, the effulgence of the Lord's transcendental body. Penetrating through the Brahma Jyoti, we come to the Vaikuntha planets. We're showing 24 planets of the Vaikuntha realm in this model. The Lord with four arms is holding the conch, disc, club and lotus. And the various combinations of those four make 24. Then we come to Galoga Vrindavan. Here we can see Radha Madhava. But we'll also be showing the other primary rasas. Krishna with the cowherd boys, Krishna being served, Krishna with Mother Yashoda. So this is an overview of the planetary display to be shown in the main dome of the temple.